Hello! Today I'm going to talk about integrated circuits. There have been a number of ways that electronic circuits have been built over the years. Of course, at first they were built point to point, where we had little devices that held oh, a number of metal loops that we could solder components to and lead them over off to other components and have wires lead off to those. These were very time consuming to make. Here's a picture of a circuit that was put together in this manner. And later on, the printed circuit board was developed. This is where we have a copper clad board that has holes drilled in it where we can put component leads through the holes. And then we etch away the copper that's unneeded to make traces around that board to connect the components together, solder the components to the proper places on the board, and you have a circuit. Of course, the first circuits tended to use vacuum tubes. When transistors came along, we also developed the printed circuit board, so that was a miniaturization of both the component and the circuit itself. But then, the way of making transistors was streamlined. So for example, to make a transistor, they would do something like this. Start with some, let's say, some n-type material. I'm not sure why they used non-intrinsic material, but they did. And we'll diffuse in some p-type atoms, so some aluminum or some gallium or something like that to make a p-region. Then we'll diffuse in some n-type material, and then, and then some more p-type material. So we have p, n, p. Put down an aluminum pad so we can make a connection, put some more here so we can make another connection, put some more there so we can make another connection, and so there would be well, let's assume that's the emitter, there's the base, and there's the collector. So we would put these transistors on a single piece of silicon with this type of manufacturing. So how long do you think it was before somebody said, hey, why don't we put multiple transistors on a single piece of silicon? But of course, the next step would be to make whole circuits. So now we can diffuse in uh, different materials to make, oh, let's make a wafer here. We'll diffuse in a transistor here, a diode there, a field effect transistor here, uh, uh, diffuse some material in here to make a resistor. Um, they can make almost any component. They could make inductors and capacitors, but of course only very tiny ones. But then these could be linked together in the wafer itself. So there's a connection between the two components there. And so we could have whole circuits on site a single piece of silicon. And this is all done photographically. So the first ones, they probably had a big desk where they did the drawings, but I've seen pictures of whole rooms with a big piece of paper that has been printed out by a CAD machine. And they're inspecting it to make sure that this drawing is going to be right to make the negatives to make the integrated circuits. So how did they do that? It was a photographic method where to make one layer, here's our base piece of material. And so let's say we wanted to diffuse in a certain amount of material there. So what we will do is put a layer of what's called photoresist on top of that. It's a material, it's kind of like a lacquer that is sensitive to light. It's soft when they put it on, but then if they expose it to ultraviolet light, it hardens. And so then they put a negative on top of that. And so they want to be able to diffuse material in here, so they want to make sure they leave that soft. So they're going to darken that part of the negative. And so now they expose it to light. That hardens this material right here. I'll try to fill that in. It hardens this material over here also. Leaving this soft, they remove the negative. Then they wash it in a solvent, which washes away that resist. So now they have an exposed area. Well, it's, that's not done to it yet. They have an exposed area. They put this into a pressurized gas chamber that has ions of the material they want to diffuse in. That material diffuses in. And so they have that, let's say, P-type material diffused in. Then they use a stronger solvent to wash off the resisting material. And let's say we want to diffuse in here an in region. Let's say you're just making a diode or a field effect transistor. So we want to diffuse in that area now. So we put our resist on again. Then we put a 
another negative up here. And once again, we want to leave an area here unhardened, so it's going to be dark in here. I'm going to expose it. That's going to harden this material and harden that material. Take off the negative. Wash it with solvent, which is going to leave our resist here and here, an exposed area in the middle. Getting kind of a messy drawing, but there's our resist still there. All the way up to about here now, so the diffuse material in. And they just use mask after mask or negative after negative to do this over and over until they make the integrated circuit. You can imagine what that takes in modern circuits that have millions or billions of transistors. So it's all done photographically, and we can get that down to very, very small scales because you start with that drawing that's as big as a room, and then we use photographic techniques to shrink it down, down, down to a very small negative to where we finally have pieces of silicon, which are wafers that are anywhere from about this big to maybe about that big. And if you ever see pictures of these, you'll find that these wafers have a whole grid of integrated circuits on them. And of course, if this is a microprocessor, they're going to be big like I'm making here. And they have test instruments that can put a bunch of contacts down, little tiny needlepoint contacts, and test these circuits. And some are going to work and some aren't. And so they mark the ones that aren't going to work one way or another. Might be just a pin with an X, who knows? And then they have a machine that will score this along these lines and then break it just like cutting glass. And then you end up with a bunch of individual chips. And when these chips are finished, they're put in a package. Typical packages are the T05, which is the same that a lot of transistors go into. So it's a little can with a rim around it and a tab and eight pins or so. If you look down from the top, just like a transistor, it has the little tab, but instead of being the emitter of the transistor, that is going to be, looking down from the top, that's going to be pin number one. But the more popular package nowadays would be a DIP package, which has a number of pins on each side. DIP stands for Dual Inline Package, D-I-P. And there's going to be a mark of some sort, often a little dot that represents pin one, and you count around counterclockwise from one down to round up to the highest numbered pin. So if one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, that's a fourteen pin dip there. So those are the most power popular packages for a long time. But now we have other packages such as surface mount, and those are packages if we look from the side, the pins come out and fold under. And then they solder directly to the board instead of going through holes like the dip package. If we look at the sides of the dip package, it had pins that went down and through holes in the circuit board. Here it's soldered directly to the top. And there's a number of different packages. I don't think I can go through all of them, but a number of different types of packages for different integrated circuits, depending on what you're planning to do with them. And some are made for ease of use. Others are made for mass production. And that's the kinds of packages we have. So using integrated circuits, there's basically two types. We have digital and analog circuits. Digital circuits, of course, are used for digital, digital devices and analog for you know, anything from uh, amplifiers to radios or whatever. But one thing about them is we may have an integrated circuit that's that big with its little legs. But let's say we need a lot of inductance or a lot of capacitance. You're not going to fit it in that little package. So very few integrated circuits work out of the box as they are, at least analog circuits. Digital circuits can, but analog circuits usually have to have capacitors and inductors on the outside, and also extra resistors. Sometimes we need different bias voltages on the outside, so there might be a couple of extra resistors out here to bias something. So there's always some external circuitry, especially capacitors and inductors, because it, you can't make big capacitors and inductors small on an integrated circuit. Now, of course, digital circuits tend to need fewer outside components, so you might find a lot of digital circuits without them. One thing you will find, though, is that you'll usually see a little capacitor next to every digital circuit. 
It's called a decoupling capacitor that goes between the power and the ground. When we look at these circuits, there's pin one there. One will be the power, one's going to be the ground, and the other ones are signals. Same thing with a digital circuit. So let's say this is the power, there's the ground, the VCC as we call it. And so our positive voltage goes there, our negative voltage goes there, and this capacitor goes across those. That's to absorb transient noise that's going between these circuits that you often find on digital circuits. So there's not that much more to say about it, uh, how they're manufactured, how they're packaged, how we'll encounter them, troubleshooting them. Typically when an integrated circuit goes bad, you're going to find either it's an open circuit or a short circuit. So something that should have some voltage on it is going to have supply voltage or no voltage. We don't usually check it with an ohm meter, but if we have a shorted circuit between a couple of these pins, then it's going to be the same voltage as something nearby, and that tells us it's a short circuit. Or if it should be one voltage and it's either the ground or the supply voltage, we know there's an open circuit somewhere, probably inside there. So something blew inside the chip. And so one of those little traces made by diffusing material into the silicon has gone bad, and so it's going to show either an open or a short. Very often, the entire chip is just completely shorted because basically it melted inside or something, or something actually burned and popped open. I have actually seen integrated circuits pop, and you'll be a little divot. Looks like a little cone down to where the chip used to be that exploded. I've seen that happen. So what do we need to know about integrated circuits? We need to know where the pin one is and which way to read that around. And this type of circuit, it's going to be where the little notch is. Some of these circuits have a little notch there, so that indicates that's pin one or a little circle in the same place. And so if we're troubleshooting, the, the schematic's going to show us which pin does which job, and we need to know which pin we're poking at there, so that's how we know that. And on the TO3s, you're going to have a little tab there at pin one, and then read that around counterclockwise too. And that when they fail, they tend to either show open or short circuit conditions. Because how do you repair an integrated circuit? You remove it and you replace it. There's no repairing an integrated circuit, no matter how simple or complex it happens to be. So they're ubiquitous, we see them everywhere, but there's not that much to say about them on their own. But when we get into the individual circuits, there's lots to say about what a particular one will do, and we'll deal with that when we come to it. So I hope you found this useful and informative. If you did, please give me a thumbs up. It helps the channel. And if you want to learn electronics technology, you can take my free course at Vocademy. You'll find that at vocademy.net. If you want to help me put these videos online and keep Vocademy free, you can pledge your support at patreon.com slash vocademy. And a big thank you to my patrons who are making all this possible. And thanks to everyone for watching.